over at bangthebook.com. We are your one-stop shop for sports betting news and information. Obviously, we had a lot of site maintenance going on yesterday, hoping a lot of those things are ironed out here for today. But lots of good content for you to check out on the daily over there at the website. So please make sure that you head on over there and do that. And of course, as you know, this and every edition of Bang the Book Radio presented by our friends over at DSI Sportsbook. BTB and the number 200 is that promo code. 100% deposit match bonus for the sportsbook. 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino at BetDSI. It's only a game until you bet it. A couple guests on the program here today, and we start with Greg Peterson at GUnit underscore 81 on Twitter. Greg, how's it going today, man? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me, Adam. Always a pleasure to have you on the show, man. Thank you so much for joining me. And, uh, you know, I'm sure some people may be kind of lamenting the fact that, you know, they'll say there's not much going on here this week with the Super Bowl still about 10 days away here. But you've had back-to-back four-hour podcasts on Saturdays (laughs) for your Hooping with Hoops podcast. Uh, I don't know how you do it, man, and and I certainly uh, sympathize with the editor of the show. Yeah, it's quite a lengthy one. But with that said, that's because we've got so many games. You now got 130 plus games on these boards for Saturdays. And you've got a little bit of everything. If you want the sizzle with something like a Duke versus Louisville matchup, you're going to have those on Saturdays. If you want to be betting on like McNeese State versus New Orleans, something like that, there's something for you as well. Well, and that's the thing. You know, there are so many conferences, a lot of different things to consider. And, of course, you play every game side in total. So we do talk a lot about conference specialization on this show for people that may not have a lot of time to handicap the full card, but you specialize in every conference. So I could probably throw any curveball I wanted to at you here on this show, and you would have an answer for it for me. But a couple of topics I wanted to talk about here today, and that's kind of what we're going to do with Greg's segments here on the show Talk about a couple of different topics, then dig into a few games here. Sample size, small sample size versus big sample size, because obviously now we're in conference play. Some teams have played, you know, six, seven conference games to this point, played a lot of non-conference early on in the year. How do you sort of evaluate a team's body of work at this point in time when it's almost exclusively conference play? Are you looking at the short term, you know, the smaller sample size of conference play? Or are you still looking at everything year to date? I think that it's important to take a little bit of everything into context. You don't want to just completely throw out the results that happened in November. But at the same time, what's really important, you have to take a look at the roster that's out there right now. Because you can't evaluate Michigan from November when they were knocking off all those teams in the bad boy Moore's battle for Atlantis when they don't have Isaiah Livers in the fold. They're a completely different team without him. He's been out for now four or five games, something like that. Guy that shoots 50% from three, 13 points per game. This is a squad that's been completely different without him. With that, you have to take a look a little bit more at Michigan's last five games. Give those a little bit more weight rather than the entire season. Meanwhile, at the same time, you have to take a look at a couple of these other teams. And there are actually some teams that haven't played a lot of games this new year. You take a look at a team like an Iona, like a Yale, a lot of these Ivy League teams, they wound up having some very long Christmas breaks. They're going to be playing against one another with them having these very long breaks. You have to put a little bit more stock into what they've done for the season in general because, let's face it, you don't have a very big sample size. Obviously, with a school like North Carolina, you have to judge them based on how they've been playing without Cole Anthony and how they've been playing without Cole Anthony. Well, it's been a local goal, so you have that coming to mind as well. So you have to do a little bit of everything. You need to take a look at some results from the beginning of the year. I put a little bit more weight on last five personally, but with that said, I do think the conference play is very important, but at the same time, don't just completely chuck out the window what you saw earlier in the year as well. Well, and I, I think one of the things that's important, and I mean, this game did go over the total with Butler and Villanova, but you know, it, it had been brought up earlier this week on the show that, you know, Villanova was using a little bit more of the shot clock here in Big East play. So I think kind of looking at these smaller sample size matters, maybe a little bit more from a total standpoint, just because you can see if teams have maybe slowed down, if teams have sped up. And obviously, too, you mentioned, you know, a key injury like a guy like Isaiah Livers. We've talked about this before on the show. If a big guy goes out, maybe a team plays a little bit faster. If a guard goes out, 
Maybe a team plays a little bit slower, trying to take better care of the basketball. You do want to keep up with those on more of a shorter term basis. I totally agree with you. And you will see tempo changes from teams from like non-conference play to conference play. That is something that you certainly do want to keep in mind because with Arkansas, they were a bunch that I think that in their first seven games of the year, opponents shot 16% from three point range on them. You knew that that was bound to regress a little bit as well. They're actually a squad that they like to push the tempo a little bit more. Still very good under team. Still do a great job of being able to guard the arc. But with that said, you can't be like, oh, this is a team that in their first seven games, they played all of them under. They're still just an under team. You have to take a look at a little bit of everything. And you have to realize that with some of these trends, some of them are bound to regress. We saw that with the Big Ten home teams going into Tuesday. They were 42-7 and seven straight up in conference play. We saw two of the three lose yesterday. So you have to keep that in the back of your mind as well. If you see something that is just uber, uber hot, it's probably going to dry up a little bit. When, with that said, you have some over-conferences. You have some under-conferences. You have to take all of this into context. You have to take into context the last five, how a team has been tempo shifting as well, because we're even seeing it with a squad like Central Connecticut State. Their first three games in conference, they scored 69-plus points. In their last four, they have failed to get past 65 in any of them as well. So it's sort of trying to play that balance game, for lack of a better term. Well, and of course, too, you know, you talk about a team like Central Connecticut State. Your average college basketball fan doesn't even know what conference that team is in. And the odds makers, of course, worried about the games that get the larger handles. So if you isolate something like that in a low major conference or even something below low major, like a Central Connecticut State team, that's an angle that may hang around for a little while. But if a team like Duke or Kansas or Texas Tech or somebody you know, make some sort of concerted effort to do something differently, the books are going to know. So it's a little bit tougher to get value on those types of things. I do totally agree with you. I think that you have to be taking a look at some of these lesser teams and trying to keep up with the injury wire. Like with St. Clair, for example, this is a squad that they've had a tempo shift exactly like you've been talking about. Big reason why. Point guard Cameron Parker, guy that was averaging over seven assists per game. It was announced, I believe yesterday, might have been two days ago, that he is now done for the year. That is certainly going to affect this team. Bookmakers, they probably don't know exactly how much of an effect that's going to have on them. Well, as a result, St. Cunard, I think it's broken 70 points once in their last five games. And this is a bunch that was playing at one of the fastest tempos in all of college basketball. So being able to keep up with things like that and noticing changes whenever a player is on the fold for like a Sacred Heart, for a team like maybe a Lamar, one of those little teams, it can make you a whole lot of money. Now, like I said, you play every side in total. And obviously, you're well-versed in all 353 teams. I mean, you've name-dropped Central Connecticut State and Sacred Heart already so far on this segment here today. But people are going to sit there and say, well, Greg can't know every one of these teams. He can't know everything inside and out. And something that's very important to point out, and we hear sharp betters, and you are a sharp guy, talk about this all the time, betting numbers and not teams. What does that mean to you? And what should it mean to our listeners? What it means is that every single team on your power rankings should have, I guess you could call it a buy point and a sell point. With so many of these teams, you always think, oh, I've got to back them. This Yale team, they've only failed to cover two games against the spread and everything like that. Well, we saw it against Howard a few days ago that Yale, who was the best cover team in all of college basketball going into Monday, covering right around 85% of their games, they just got overvalued. That opening number was 23, wound up closing 20. Yale wins the game, wins the game convincingly, but they only win the game by, like, I think it was 14 points. It's one of these situations where the market got a little bit overinflated. We've seen it with a couple of these teams that are very good against the spread. Ironically enough, we're going to have one going at it tonight in Alabama. With Yale not being able to cover on Monday, they are now the best cover team in all of college basketball at 14-3. and three. I want to take them against Vanderbilt personally, but you have to have in the back of your mind, okay, at some point the bookmakers are probably going to adjust a little bit too much, and at that point I'm going to need to sell on an Alabama team that has been making me a whole lot of money so far this year. And there are going to be teams that naturally are better against the spread. We saw it last year, Drake, 24-7-1 against the spread, no doubt. They're making a lot of money, but at the same time, 
you have to know that if these numbers get up a little bit too high, you need to have a little bit of a sell point as well. And even a team that is awful, like we were talking off here about Chicago and State. This is one of the most wretched teams I've ever seen in my life. They have not been able to cover pretty much anything. They're in the bottom five over the last two years with regards to cover rate. But if you give Chicago State 75 points against Cal Baptist, you have to think the 75 points because there is always a buy point on every one of these teams. You're not just betting the team name in front of the jersey. You're betting exactly how many points they are laying, getting, what have you, because that is what ultimately makes the difference, betting numbers and not teams. Speaking of Chicago State, do you think they have more fan support at the games or more betting support in the market? Oh, betting support in the market. No fans are much about it. I saw photos from their game. I think it was on Thursday. I think I literally was able to count on one side of the court the number of fans that they had on two fingers. It was absolutely incredible. It was as if you were watching a high school practice with, like, no, not even the parents were there. It was absolutely stunning. Not even the parents were in attendance for Chicago State. It was just one of these situations where how do you award three points of home court advantage for a team that may not have three home court fans? I mean, wh- what do you do in that city? I mean, is, is that a negative home court advantage? I, obviously, there's long travel in the wax, so that is part of it. But, I mean, it's got to be depressing to step out onto your home floor and there's, like, six people in the building that aren't employees. I, I just I don't know what you do with that. Yeah, it's just an absolute thing. I, I, it's crazy. It's, it's one it, of those situations where it's one of those situations where Chicago is eight, where I wound up just having it as pretty much a neutral court game. It's one of those things where you don't necessarily downgrade them because like you said, travel in the whack is bad. When you have to go from Grand Canyon, which is based out in the state of Arizona, all the way to the state of Illinois, that is something. But at the same time, if you're Chicago state, you take the floor and it's like, wow, my mom's not even in attendance. That's something to take into account as well. So I pretty much counted it as a wash. And Chicago State is so bad that even if they did get fan support, I don't think it would fire them up. Well, one other thing I want to mention here, you know, talking about buy points and sell points. And a lot of people do equate the sports betting markets to the stock market where, you know, you do want to buy low, sell high, sort of look for some of these, you know, teams with some trend lines where maybe they're trending up. You try to get in a little bit early with that. If they're trending down, you try to sell a little bit early. And you know, with so many teams out there, it's obviously very hard to follow uh, you know, all this type of stuff. So do you have kind of like a, a cheat sheet or you know, something that you can use to you know, just kind of get through this a little bit quicker playing every game? Or, I mean, are you just you know, putting in your due diligence on, on every single one and you know, not having any preconceived notions about one side or another? It's one of these things where I have to take a look at every single game individually. Now, there are some games where it's a little bit easier than others. Like with Chicago say it's like, all right, against Cal Baptist, are they catching 30? No, we are taking Cal Baptist. But with that said, you have to do a little bit more deep dive on some of these games. Like at Notre Dame versus Syracuse, you have to factor in the fact that Syracuse wound up losing on their home floor at the Carrier Dome against Notre Dame just a few weeks ago. So that's a little bit of a fresh wound. You have to take a look at Notre Dame, the fact that they're in the top 10 in the country with regards to fewest turnovers committed. I have to look at Syracuse and the fact that they're down to pretty much a six-man rotation as well. It's just factoring all those little things into it, trying to factor, okay, what might be a little bit of a difference maker? Can Buddy Bayheim continue to shoot from three the way that he has been all year long? It's been absolutely ridiculous how hot he's been. You have to factor in a little bit of veteran leadership as well. And a big thing that gets lost on a lot of people, coaching. You have to adjust it a little bit game to game because there are some games in which coaching is going to be able to come in to play a little bit more. There are some coaches that sometimes they let off the gas pedal a little bit more in a little bit of a blow game. And I think that that's big for games with bigger spreads like a Gonzaga. A Gonzaga is a squad that has been just blowing out teams left and right despite the fact that they're laying 20 points on the regular. We saw them go up against the Santa Clara team that was 15-3 and three straight up. They win that game by 50. They showed absolutely no mercy whatsoever. Meanwhile, you take a look at a Wisconsin team last night against Nebraska. They wind up not covering the spread because in the last couple of seconds of the game, they wound up having all their walk-ons out there. And Waukee McWalk-on winds up fouling a guy from Nebraska with like two seconds left. Nebraska was down 16. Closing number at most places was 15 and a half. 
Nebraska gets two free throws, they cover the number. That is something that you want to take into account as well. Just some of those little things that I don't think that a lot of people keep in mind, but sometimes make the difference. Now, something we've talked about a couple of times on this show here is that, you know, a lot of people are getting into the college basketball market now because college football is over, the NFL winding down, obviously, with just one game left to go. And that brings me to tonight's Rutgers versus Iowa game, game 839-840. In fact, I previewed this game over at bangthebook.com, so for anybody that wants to check that out, head on over to the website and you can do that. But we don't think of Rutgers as a top 25 team. In fact, Rutgers, I think, has matched their season win total from last year already and has won off the previous two years when they won 15 games. They take on Iowa here tonight. Everybody knows all about the Big Ten and how good it's been for home teams. A lot of people may look to fade Rutgers just saying, well, Rutgers usually isn't very good. I can't expect them to continue what they're doing here. What do you think about this game tonight in Iowa City? I think that this is a spot which Iowa is going to be able to keep rolling. This is a Rutgers team that is just so different away from the rack than they are at home. At home, I believe that they're undefeated so far this year. On the road, they just have not necessarily been that same team. I know that they've got a road win to their credit, but with that said, they are a squad that doesn't necessarily shoot it well from three. Carver Hawkeye Arena, not necessarily an easy place to get to. When you factor in the fact that Rutgers is out there in the state of New Jersey as well, you now have much more travel in the Big Ten than back when I was a kid. So it certainly has been a little bit of change. And for Iowa, what you've got is a team that also does a very good job of being able to hold the ball. They rank in the top ten with regards to assist or turnover ratio. They've been playing without Jordan Bohannon, who's out with hip surgery. But with that said, they've been having a bunch of guys that have been able to step up to the plate without him. you got a guy in Connor McCaffrey, less than a turnover for, per game. He has been highly efficient for this team. Luca Garza. Just going to be the best player down low. Over 22 points per game, 10 rebounds. I don't see how Rutgers is going to be able to match up with him. And what you've got with these two teams is a very interesting blend of tempos. Rutgers wants to play a little bit lower and slower. And Iowa's been a little bit slower so far this year as well. But they've just been highly efficient with their possessions, which I think is intriguing. With Rutgers, I don't think that they've allowed more than 65 points in any of their last five games. The offense has been scuffling a little bit because Geo Baker has been in and out of the fold. But with that said, I think that with this Iowa team, if they can just knock down a couple of shots, it'll force Rutgers into a game that they don't necessarily want to play. They're going to be playing a little bit of catch-up ball. And that plays right into the hands of the Hawkeyes. And I feel like this is a Rutgers team that they're either going to give up a very small amount of points, which is fewer than 65 points, or they're going to give up 75 plus. I don't see a lot of in between. I think that Iowa by being able to knock down some early shots and being able to get the crowd behind them, going to be able to speed this game up. All right, so let's jump down to game 847-848 here. Memphis and Tulsa. Memphis, again, another recognizable brand, a ranked team. But they're on the road in a little bit of a tricky spot here tonight against the Tulsa team that has played pretty well for the most part here this season. That being said, this line up from Memphis minus three to minus three and a half. What do you think about this AAC matchup tonight, Greg? Yeah, despite the move, I do, do like Memphis in this spot just because with Memphis, they should be able to completely decimate Tulsa on the glass. And what you like about Memphis in regards to a per-possession basis, they are number two in the country with regards to defensive efficiency. We saw about a week ago the, the way that they put the clamps down on Cincinnati. Cincinnati winds up scoring 49 points in that game. Now, granted, this is a Cincinnati squad that's certainly struggling in offense, but it's also really much better. You got Brandon Rochelle, who's able to give you a double-digit amount of points. He comes over as a transfer from LSU, but you really don't have that number two guy that has really been consistent for this team. Got a guy like an Elijah Joyner that's able to dish out a couple of assists. And with Memphis, last week they were playing with DJ Jeffries back. He was dealing with some injuries. You can tell that he wasn't necessarily 100%, but I think that a couple days of rest is going to do him a little bit of good. And with this Memphis team, they've been getting back quite a few guys from injuries. They've been getting them back into the flow of the last couple of games. When you've got all that you do down low as well, it gives you those second and third chances. Memphis not necessarily great at the free throw line, but when you get chance after chance after chance, allows you to put points up on the board. I think that Memphis just has too much for Tulsa to overcome. And I think that Tulsa is just not going to be able to stand up in the battle on the glass. And I think that it's going to result in Memphis being able to win this game by multiple possessions, despite the free throw shooting being a little bit lackadaisical. All 
All right, last game on the main board here. We do have some games on the added board, but the last game on the main board, UNLV and Nevada. Obviously, this one with some local flair for you being out there in Mountain West country in Las Vegas. Nevada, four and a half or five point favorite out there, depending on where you look. What do you think about this one in the Mountain West this evening? It's a really interesting game. You talk about tempo shifts. UNLV has been able to push it a little bit more. So I do like the way that they've been able to We'll turn over a little bit of a new leaf. Omari Hardy has been shooting in the mid-30s from 30-point range with a little bit over 15 points per game. But then you take a look at Nevada. Jazz Johnson, Jalen Harris, along with Lindsey Drew. These three guys combined average, I would say, 46-plus points per game. They do an absolutely tremendous job of being able to hit threes. They're going to have a size and disadvantage out loud. Chuck and Bang De Young for, Nevada, for UNLV is able to give the team a little bit over nine rebounds per game. But we see Nevada be able to get past teams that – do have a little bit more size. They have a lot of shiftiness. I think the big thing for Nevada is trying to be able to get their tempo early in games. And with UNLV, turning things up all of a sudden, because keep in mind, they bring in TJ Otzelberger from South Dakota State. South Dakota State was always a squad that was looking to run it and gun it. It feels like he's finally starting to get his style implemented with a UNLV team and a little bit of transition in a road spot. I do like the way that Nevada should be able to take advantage of that. I think it's going to cause for some open looks for Nevada from three-point range. I think that a guy like a Jazz Johnson is going to be able to knock them down. Now, Nevada, obviously with a new coach as well, and Steve Alford, but it feels like he's been doing a very good job of really adapting to his guys rather than trying to implement his style. And as a result, we've seen a little bit of success from the Wolfpack so far this year, and I think it's going to continue. I think that they take care of business on their home floor and cover the number. Now, I know that people always ask you on Twitter, and again, you can follow Greg on Twitter, at GUnit underscore 81. People always ask you, what's your favorite play of the day? You know, because they don't want to take all of the games since you play every game side in total. But I'm not going to ask you that. I'm just curious, outside of the three games that we talked about here tonight, which one's most intriguing to you for the January 22nd card? That is a good question. I do think that that... UNLV versus Nevada game is something that I'm certainly going to be keeping my eye on. When you take a look at the Big Ten, will the home teams be able to continue to reign supreme? So we were talking about that Iowa game a little bit earlier. That's one that I'm certainly going to be keeping my eye on. But how about a game like a St. Bonaventure versus Dayton? St. Bonaventure on the open was catching about 15 and a half points. It's now actually ballooned a little bit more for Dayton. I don't understand why. Now, Dayton is a squad that I think can make the second weekend of the tournament. They are absolutely tremendous. They've got a guy in Trey Landers that goes completely under the radar. He gives the team a double-digit amount of points, chips in their five rebounds, everything like that. But with St. Bonaventure, I feel like we're responding a little bit too much to what we saw last. They got blasted by VCU by kind of 91 to 63. But prior to that, they had had a bunch of very good wins on the resume. to go on the road. They knock out. Off George Mason by a double digit amount of points. Ever since Usan Usani got back in the fold for this bunch, they've been doing a great job of being able to cover spreads. I just don't understand why St. Bonaventure is catching so many points in this spot. I think this is a situation in which, like I was talking about a little bit earlier, you're betting numbers and not teams. The number makes me all aboard St. Bonaventure, even though the team in Dayton is very good. All right, speaking of numbers, let's transition over to the NFL side of things here. Talk a little bit about Super Bowl 54, February 2nd. Of course, the game date, about 10 days away from that now. So, you know, as we take a look at this one, Kansas City took some initial money, got up to one and a half. Some places opted to show minus two. Now we're back down to minus one pretty much across the board here. The total seems to have settled in a little bit as well in that 54, 54 and a half range. We'll dig in some more next week about you know prop bets and things of that sort for the Super Bowl. But as far as your initial thoughts here on side and total, Greg, what are you thinking? Oh, man, I haven't taken a look too much at the props personally. I was seeing that they were released by Circa, the first player to score it. The long staffers have some value there, you know? It's like 250000 to one. It's absolutely ridiculous, but... With that said, what I think is very intriguing is who do you think is going to be able to get the ball first in this spot to be able to get that prop? Because I always think that those are so interesting because I think that San Francisco has a little bit of better defense than the Kansas City Chiefs. But 
I think that what people are forgetting about the Kansas City Chiefs is the fact that prior to the playoffs, they give it up 21 points of fewer in like their last six or seven games of the season. So they're a squad that was playing very well there with the 49ers who've obviously got a great pass rush. We saw the way that they were able to do it twice to the Green Bay Packers. So I think that this is a spot in which I do lean towards the 49ers a little bit. I'm probably going to be buying into a lot of their defensive props. I'm going to need to see a little bit more in regards to just the will player X be able to get a sack prop or not try to look for some value with that regard, but I'll probably be investing in quite a few of them. And something that I always try to look at with regards to NFL props is some of the multi-sport props, because something that I did last year was I took a prop with, will the Capitals be able to get more goals than the sacks in the Super Bowl? I remember that prop was the easiest money ever because I think that you were having to lay a half a sack with the sacks, but the Capitals against the Bruins on that day, the Capitals scored zero goals. So my prop cash in the first quarter, when sack number one was had. Now, I mean, there's so much to talk about with the prop stuff. And and again, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of nuance to handicapping props and sort of trying to figure out game flow and all that type of thing. So it does take time to kind of put those thoughts together. And obviously, uh, as we get more books posting these, we'll have some more lines to talk about. What about the game line itself here with Kansas City minus one and that total 54, 54 and a half? Have you locked in a position for the game yet? You know, just overall, or are you still kind of letting the market settle in a bit? I know exactly where I'm going to be on the game. I'm going to be on the 49ers money line, and I'm going to be playing this total under. I'm just right now trying to see if this total goes a little bit northward, because as we know, the public typically likes to bet a little bit more on the overside of things. I think that a lot of people are going to be enamored by Patrick Mahomes as well, which will offer a little bit more value for that 49ers side. But with that said, I know exactly where I'm going to be going with this game. You really don't have too many injury concerns. Tevin Coleman is the lone one for the 49ers, but let's face it, it's a Super Bowl. Unless if he is like having his pancreas explode the night before the game, he's probably going to be playing in this one. Pretty much everyone that has a borderline injury is going to be playing in this game. So I'm not going to be swayed by that at all. And even if Tevin Coleman would not be in the game, Mosser looks very good in that game against the Green Bay Packers. I would have a lot of faith in him being able to hold down the fort. So I know exactly where I'm going to be on the game. I'm just right now waiting to see Mo because I feel like I'm on opposite sides of the public. Yeah, it certainly looks that way. And uh, look, man, a lot of good information here on today's segment with Greg Peterson at GUnit underscore 81 on Twitter. Greg, I know you're one of the busiest men in the business, man. Where can people find your stuff? You can find me on Twitter at GUnit underscore 81. That's all for everything. You mentioned the Hooping with Hoops college basketball podcast. You can find that on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, and TuneIn, which is pretty much the place where I break down every single college basketball game every single day. You were talking about those four-hour podcasts on Saturday. They are real. I really break down every one of these games all fresh after the numbers come out. So it's pretty much a job in which it starts very early in the morning with doing my power rankings, taking a look at the board and everything like that, and then posting up the podcast. I'm a sleepless man on those days. And then you can also find my work in VSIN's Points Red Weekly, like you were mentioning. And whenever I do have an appearance on VSIN, like I will be today at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, that'll also be posted up on my Twitter feed at GUNIT underscore 81. Well, of course, make sure you follow Greg there on Twitter at GUNIT underscore 81. Greg Peterson of the Hoopin' with Hoops podcast and regular contributor to VSIN. Appreciate your time as always, man. Thank you so much for joining me. And we'll talk to you again next week. Awesome, boys. A pleasure. Thank you.